Well, I mean, thank you all for being here, and I did very much enjoy that song by young Jonathan. What a blessing Jonathan's been to our church, and tremendous encouragement. It thrills my heart to see these young people come and move on with God. They're in our church of tomorrow, and we need to treasure them. They're precious people, That's right. and we need to be praying for them as they continue to fly the flag when some, some of us will already be with the Lord in future days. And so we're grateful for them. Also, we're grateful so much for John and Kay Vandenhurt being with us for the last month. It's been a real thrill and a blessing to have them amongst us. And uh, I was just thinking back there while we were thinking of announcements and prayer requests and I remember way back to July 2007 in Corby when I had the privilege of marrying Jonathan and Natalie. That was when we first met John and Kay and also Jonathan's sister Anne, uh, Anna in Corby and uh, it was a great thrill to meet them then and it's been seven years next month since we last saw them. Seven years ago when these folks got married and you know seven in the Bible of course is the picture of completeness and perfection. Uh, well, no marriage is perfect, but I just thank God for Jonathan and Natalie. What a tremendous thing is. When, when, when we married them, we really had no idea that they would ever end up here in Peterborough, England. We knew that God had his hand upon them, and we knew that he was going to lead them in a special way, and he has done and we are thrilled skinny, to use an English terminology, <laughs> that they are here with us in Peterborough. But it has really been great, John and Kay, to see you again. And uh, please give our love to all the rest of your family there in Tennessee when you arrive back. And we do look forward, maybe, maybe to seeing Daniel and Anna. Anna's got married since we last saw her. Daniel and Anna, and also the young one as well in future days when they come to visit England and we will certainly be praying for you on that long trip you have home tomorrow. No, airports are a nightmare but God can change all that around and make it a blessing for you and that's what we're expecting to happen tomorrow. Well no prizes tonight as to what book we're looking at uh, so if you look to the book of Colossians chapter 1 this evening and uh, for those of you who have been able to be here during this uh, brief series uh, Pastor Jonathan asked me just to do a four week series during June on the book of Colossians and you may remember the very first week we started in the right place and that was the preeminence of Christ because yes. that of course is the overall theme of the book and that's always the starting place so Jesus first, Jesus second and Jesus third and that's what we thought about in the preeminence of Christ the first week and then the second week we looked at the will of God, which is absolutely vital that we have to line up with the will of God for God's blessings. And then last Sunday morning we looked at God's expectations of a Christian. So the preeminence of Christ, number one. The will of God, number two. God's expectations of a Christian, last week's message. And tonight as we wrap up this short series, I thought it would be good for us to look at the Christian character in the book of Colossians. The Christian character in the book of Colossians. And so we're going to look at that. And it is really quite amazing. We shouldn't be amazed, but I was amazed as I studied out this book as to how much Paul says concerning our character. And you know, character is really, really important. A person often stands or falls on their character. A person is often remembered by their character. And I think it's probably true to say that in evangelical circles of Christians, very often we concentrate very much on service and doing things. And of course that is important. God wants us to serve Him and He does want us to do things. But sometimes we forget this aspect of character. There was a, a, a dear faithful preacher who I got to know in Corby many years ago. He's now with the Lord. But he used to say to me every time he saw me, he said, Brother Colin, he said, church is so important, we need to do it every night. I remember that uh, statement very clearly. Church is so important, 
we need to do it every night. Now, I love this brother, and he was a good preacher, but I don't think he was right. Because actually, we need to be careful sometimes that our service doesn't become something of always doing, that we're so busy that we're not really allowing God time to change our character. Because at the end of the day, I remember one year in Corby in 2005, we had a little slogan in the church at our school of evangelism, reach a million lives in 2005. And we did. We gave out over a million gospel tracts in that year. And all of that may be very wonderful. And all of the service we do for God may be very wonderful. But actually... God is concerned even more than that about our character. He's concerned about who we are in Him and He's concerned about changing us into the image of His Son. I'm not in any way decrying service. I'm the first to get on with some work for Jesus. We saw last week. God doesn't expect us to be sluggards. But He is concerned about our character because it's going to be that by that that we are remembered. And so here, in the book of Colossians, we have some thoughts about the character of a genuine Christian. And we'll look at some of these tonight. If you're making notes, and we'll primarily stay here in the book of Colossians, we may move around just a little bit. But the first point really is so important, and that is that the character of a Christian will include faithfulness. The character of a Christian will include faithfulness. And notice how Paul mentions this here. So if you're a believer tonight, God expects our character to be proved by the fact that we're faithful to him. Have a look there in chapter 1 and verse number 2. And here Paul says, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossi. Look at verse number 4 of chapter 1. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. Look at verse number 7 of chapter 1. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Look at chapter 2 and verse number 5. And the Bible says there, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Look at chapter 4 and verse number 7. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Look at chapter 4 and verse number 9. With Onesimus, a faithful and loved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. So you see the emphasis there. Paul names some who are faithful. And he's saying here that the characteristic of these Christians who he wrote to at Colossae, one of their characteristics was they were faithful. He calls them faithful brethren. So there's an outstanding mark and characteristic here of a Christian. You see, people would expect to see in our character that we love Jesus so much that we're thrilled by what he's done, that we're excited about the cross, that we're blessed by knowing we're going to heaven, that the natural outworking of that is... I love him so much that to the best of my ability and his power, I'm going to be faithful to him. Amen. That must be a characteristic of a Christian. In other words, we don't take the business of God lightly. We take it seriously and we form a commitment to Christ. Jesus talked about us taking up our cross and denying ourselves. That's a very important statement. And following him. And so the first character, the first uh, character of a characteristic of a genuine Christian is, will we'll include faithfulness. And then secondly in this book, the character of a genuine Christian will include 
Christian love. Very important. In fact, elsewhere in the Bible, of course, we're told that charity love uh, forms right at the top of the tree. Have a look here, again, about what Paul says about the character of these Christians. Verse number one, chapter number one and verse number four. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which ye have to all the saints. Look at verse number eight of chapter one. Who also declared unto us your love in the spirit. Look at chapter 2 and verse number 2. And the Bible says that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. Look at chapter 3 and verse number 14. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfect, perfectness. Perfectness. And so, there we're told that a characteristic of a Christian is... We should be demonstrating Christian love. Not only should we be faithful, but there's that Christian love. Now, what on earth does Christian love mean? Christian love in the Bible simply means that we're prepared to make a sacrifice for others. Christian love in the Bible simply means that we put the thoughts and feelings and interests and needs of others before ourselves. We see that, don't we, magnified in the cross. When Jesus died there on the cross, he was putting our salvation before the suffering of himself. He was making himself as nothing, and yet he was doing something which would mean everything to us. And so Christian love is very important. In other words, to a Christian, it shouldn't be an inconvenience to put themselves out and be a blessing to somebody else, because that's all part of character. You see how when somebody sees dwelling in you or I that the love of Christ dwells in us, it's attractive to people. It draws people to Christ. I've always been a believer that nothing wins people to Jesus like love. We can maybe be able to give out a million gospel tracts, but unless that love for those people is there, well, it means absolutely nothing, and the chances are it will come to nothing. That's right. And so our character, according to Colossians, should definitely be one of faithfulness to Jesus and should also definitely include Christian love. And then another characteristic of the genuine Christian here is that a ca the character of a genuine Christian will include hope. If you're a Christian here tonight, you're not a hopeless case. You see, the Bible says we have a hope looking for that blessed hope. The Bible says in Titus 2 and verse number 13. But look here, if you would, at Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 5. And Paul says there, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. That's exciting, isn't it? You see, our character will include hope. Look at verse number 23 of chapter 1. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Look at chapter 1 and verse number 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so here Paul says, if you're a believer tonight, one of the characteristics of your being should be hope. And I've told you before, if you were to line up at a bus stop here in Peterborough tomorrow and there were 20 people there, the chances are you wouldn't find a lot of hope. Most people would be miserable. They'd be complaining that it's either too hot, too wet, too cold, too windy. Or they'd be complaining about the government, they'd be complaining about this, be complaining about that. And most people in the world, without Christ, have no hope whatsoever. But you see, when we move amongst them as Christians, we can say, say, well, don't worry about the headlines in the newspapers. Don't worry about the BBC News. Don't worry about AOL Online. Most of that is hopeless. But when I read the gospel and I read about Jesus, I have a hope. And that's, that's right. what people need to see. That's right. Amen. And it's only you and I who can move amongst people to tell people that there is a hope. To remind them that there's a God in heaven who loves them. To remind them 
that there's a heaven to be gained through Jesus Christ. To remind them that the Saviour of the world has come and died for us. That's a hope, you see. There's not one person tonight should walk out of this building in a hopeless condition. Whatever problems you brought to Calvary Baptist Church tonight, Jesus is above them. He's beyond them. You can have victory over them because in Christ Jesus, there is the light of the world and the hope of the world. And that should be our character. And that should be part of us. And that's something to get excited about, isn't it? Amen. So our character should include faithfulness, should include Christian love, and it should include hope. But also, Paul says here, in this particular book, that the character of a Christian will include assurance. Assurance is really, really important. You see, the early disciples had assurance that they were saved. They knew they were going to heaven. Why? Because the Bible told them so. And they stood upon it. And you know, when God gives us assurance... And that's what he does. We'll look at that here in the moment. When he gives us that assurance, we can stand boldly for Christ. And that makes a big difference. When somebody sees Pastor Jonathan in the pulpit and they see that he believes that his preaching is from God and he believes what he's preaching, well, that is great because they see assurance. They see Jesus made a difference. The young man who came to church this morning, he was telling me all sorts of things. And I said, the problem is you have no assurance of why you're here, what the purpose of life is and where you're going. And he had to admit that was true. But you see, for the Christian, we have assurance. And if you're saved here tonight, you should have assurance of salvation. Look at chapter 2 and verse number 2. And the Bible says there that their hearts, might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. And we can look at loads of passages concerning assurance. I'm so pleased when God saved me nearly 34 years ago, this November, that from that very moment, I knew that I was saved. I knew from that very moment, that if I were to die, well, I'd be whisting to glory and see Jesus face to face. People in this world have no assurance of anything. You can't have any assurance in, in the Chancellor of the Exchequer. You can't have any assurance in the, in the stock market. You know, it goes up and down like a yo-yo, doesn't it? You can't have any assurance in the economy. And very often, most people can't even have any assurance in their relationships. But I tell you tonight, if you're a Christian, part of your character should be, I am assured that Jesus has saved me. I am assured that he's buried my sins in the depth of the ocean. I am assured that he's not going to remember my sin anymore. I am assured that he's cast my sin as far as the east is from the west. I am assured that by the blood of Christ I'm going to heaven. Hallelujah, come what may. Even if the whole world caves in, I'm assured of that fact. You see, that's the boldness and the confidence which the early apostles had. It was part of their character. Why did 11 of them die a martyr's death for the belief in the empty tomb? It was because they had assurance. Right. And we should have assurance. We, we need to get away, and you've heard me use this term before, from being wibbly-wobbly Christians. There is no reason why a saved person should not know they're saved and have assurance of that. It's a characteristic of the Christian. It winds people up when I'm out on the streets and talk to people. They get very wound up when I say, I know I'm going, I'm go, I know I'm going to heaven. And I remind them, and it's not because of what I've done. All of my righteousness is, is a filthy rags, but it's because of what he's done. Right. And so there's that assurance there. And it's good to wind people up like that. They need to know that God loves us so much that he's not going to leave us in the lurch and we can be certain. So our character will include faithfulness, it will include Christian love, it will include hope, it will include assurance, and then have a look at a few other things what it includes in chapter 3 and verse number 12, if you would. Chapter 3 and verse number 12. All of these things should be radiating out from our lives and hearts so people see 
there's a difference. You'll notice that in nearly everything I mentioned tonight, these things don't apply to the unbeliever. They know nothing about these things whatsoever. But thank God, by His grace, He's revealed these things to us. Look at chapter 3 and, and, and verse number 12, if you would. And Paul says there, and these are some of the characteristics which we should be demonstrating in our lives. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Isn't that great, you see? There Paul says, if we're a Christian, boy, one of our characteristics should be mercy to others. That's very, very important. In other words, here's Mr. Smith over here. He's done something absolutely terrible. What are we going to do? Are we going to jump all over him and condemn him? No, we're not going to do that. We're going to show him that God says it's wrong. But then we're going to drive home the fact that we want to be merciful to him. But more importantly, God in heaven wants to be merciful to him. He might have messed up. He may be wrong, but let's not be a Pharisee and drive that person in the ground. Let's show them the same mercy which God showed Colin Pavitt and you when you were saved. You see, that's one of our characteristics. Not to condemn, 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 but to say, yes, this is wrong, God says so, but nevertheless, he wants mercy. Folks, none of us would be here tonight if we're saved and be, unless it were for God's mercy. Uh, that's really, really true, isn't it? You have a look, if you would, in uh, uh, chapter 1 of the book of Luke, in verse number 78. I'm, th I'm so thankful that God was so merciful to me nearly 34 years ago, uh, and that he uh, decided to allow his grace to shine in my heart. Well, Luke chapter 1 and verse number 78, and the Bible says there, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. Isn't that great? You see, when God saved us, it was because of his tender mercy. And if we're Christians, we should show tender mercy to other people. You know, that's really significant. Most people in the world are very quick at pointing the finger to others recognizing they may have all sorts of things in their own heart, but they sort of project the problems onto other people. Whereas we should say, yeah, you've done wrong, but we want to be merciful, because so is God. Come back here to chapter 3 and verse number 12 again. Put on therefore as elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, and then kindness. Again, that's what Jesus showed us. We're told in Titus chapter 3 about uh, verse number 4 and 5 that it was because of the kindness of God that he was able to regenerate us. So kindness should certainly be a characteristic in the Christian's life. And also humbleness. Have a look here, chapter 3 and verse number 12 again of Colossians. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind. And Jesus was the greatest example of humility, wasn't he, you know? Uh, even though he was in the form of God, he was still prepared to humble himself and to die on a cross for us. So humbleness and meekness of mind should certainly be a characteristic. Then have a look also here in verse number 13 of chapter 12. This is something really important, folks, on a practical level. Chapter, thir chapter 3 and verse number 13 of Colossians. The Bible says there, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. You know, this little term here is the solution to every church problem. It really is. The scripture says here, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. And our character should be one of forbearance. What on earth does that mean? Well, let's just have a look what that means for a moment. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 15 and verse number 1. Romans chapter 15 and verse number 1. And something else which the preacher needs to learn, and maybe all of us need to learn tonight, is this forbearance. The Bible says in Romans 15 and verse number 1, We then, that are strong, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and not to please ourselves. 
Have a look at Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 2. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 2. And the Bible says there, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And what the Bible is saying here is that actually there are times when we have to put up with one another. You know, there's always people who again rub us up the wrong way, even Christians. And you've heard me say before also that Jesus never ever said that we are to like people. There are some people you just cannot like, but he did say that we are to love people. Amen. And that's really, really important. And part of that love is when a weaker brother perhaps doesn't quite come up to the standards we think he should do, well, we should forbear him and encourage him, and help him, and draw alongside him, so that he can grow in Christian maturity. That's one of our characteristics, it should be, you know. Because somebody doesn't understand a certain doctrine, maybe as well as what we do, well again, we don't condemn him, we help him to understand. That's forbearing. And he should see that we're willing to spend time to help him do that. That's a characteristic of a Christian. Amen. None of us have made it, you see. That's the truth of the matter. None of us have reached that point where we can say we know it all. If we do say that, we're just a liar, which proves we're a sinner in the first place. Mm. Have a look here again in chapter 3 and verse number 13. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Oh, that's really, really important, isn't it? Have a look in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 32. Uh, a spirit of forgiveness is so important. And the Bible says there in Ephesians 4 and verse number 32, And be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. I'd like to tell you tonight that the way in which we forgive others is directly proportional to where we are in spiritual maturity. It really takes something, it really takes a Christian with great character to be able to forgive somebody who has hurt them in one way or another. That's how Christ forgave us. And there are too many people in churches around the world who are holding grudges against somebody else in the church because Mr. X or Mrs. Y has hurt them or injured them or said something against them in some way. But you know what the Christian character is? It's to forgive. And Jesus said to Peter when Peter said, how many times should I forgive my brother? Jesus answered, indefinitely, mm. infinitely. You just keep on forgiving because that's what Christ done for us. Boy, I couldn't count the number of sins I've committed since I've been alive, but thank God he's forgiven everyone and even my sin I commit tomorrow, thank God he's still forgiving me. See, that's the character of a Christian. You, you know, uh, so many Christians get eaten up by the fact that somebody's hurt them, it keeps them awake at night, it chews away at them, and actually not forgiving somebody does you more harm in the end than the person you're not forgiving. Destroys a person. Right. And so the characteristic should be, we forgive like Christ forgave us. And when we recognise what Christ has forgiven us from, well, then it's no problem to forgive Amen. whatsoever. This is really, really important. And if you hold a grudge against somebody, if you can't forgive somebody, you need to get right with God. You really do. Because you're never going to move on in your Christian life. If you're saved and you claim to be saved, you need to be able to forgive also, that's just in the nature of a Christian. You see, you may think, well, preacher, that's so difficult. You don't understand the circumstances. Now, if you were an unbeliever and said that, I'd say, well, yeah, that's right. It's impossible for you to forgive. But when you realize what Christ has forgiven in our lives, our character should reflect mm. a spirit of forgiveness. It's really, really important. So we should forbear the weaker brother or sister. They have to grow. We had to grow, and we should forgive those who hurt us in some way or another. That shows spiritual maturity. 
Don't hold a grudge against anybody. If you do, you need to grow up as a Christian. You need to grow into Christian maturity. And so, definitely then, one of our characters as a genuine Christian will be forget forbearing and forgiving. Now, another characteristic as a Christian should be in chapter 3 and verse number 16 of the book of Colossians. And we'll soon be through, but here the Bible says, Let the word of, God, uh, word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Notice this, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And here I believe Paul is saying that a character, ristic of a genuine Christian, should be an attitude of praise. Now we need to be careful here, folks. Because there are some Christians who wander around every uh, all day and every five seconds they're saying, Praise the Lord, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, Hallelujah. And sometimes that can be just lip service to the Lord. But here, Paul is saying, if you're genuinely saved, you'll be praising the Lord in your heart. You'll be giving Him the glory in your heart. You'll be thanking him for what he's done for you. You'll be concentrating on his goodness. You'll praise him for his kindness and his mercy and his love to you. And so in our hearts we'll be singing. Just because somebody's saying praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord every three and a half seconds doesn't mean anything spiritual. Mm -hmm. But praising the Lord in our heart means much and it's a part of the Christian character. So tonight, for example, I know that our sister Jane Beatty, laying in her hospital bed, is praising the Lord. I can guarantee that, folks, because that's part of the Christian character. And I don't know who's next door to her, but I can tell you if it's an unbeliever, they won't be doing too much praising at all. They'll be doing lots of moaning and complaining. You see, that's how the Christian character shines through, right. that we, we're praising the Lord. We're thanking God, we're singing and making melody in our hearts. You see, that's where we stand out. Because here's somebody over here you see as an unbeliever, uh, and you're going through more trials than what they are, and yet you're rejoicing. Thank God that all things work out for the good for those who love God. You see, that's what shines through. It speaks to people. They don't understand it, but they see, well, that guy or that lady claims to be a Christian, and boy, there must be something different about them, because how can they possibly praise God in that circumstance? That's a character, you see. It's a different character to the paganism we see in the world. These are some of the things that the, the, the Christians at uh, Colossae show. These are the things which Paul demonstrated. Remember he wrote this book when he was in a smelly Roman dungeon. His only friends were probably the rats and his only food was bread. And yet he was still rejoicing. When I, when I look at the book of Philippians, there's no greater book in the Bible than the book of Philippians where Paul says rejoicing and rejoice so many times. How can you possibly do that when you only may see the light of day for one hour out of 24? It's character. And it's because Christ has changed him. That's what God does, you see. And so certainly there should be an attitude of praise. Amen. Look at chapter 3 and verse number 22 of Colossians. And the Bible says here, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Here's a good characteristic of a genuine Christian. And that is the characteristic of fearing the Lord. You see, you soon know who is and who isn't a Christian by how much they fear the Lord. Now when we think about fearing the Lord, we're talking about a reverent fear of God. In fact, the word reverent only occurs once in the Bible, in Psalm 111. Uh, and so you know that applies to God in Psalm 111. So if anybody calls themselves reverend, you know they're a charlatan. You know it's nothing to do with the Bible because the Bible never calls a man reverend. Mm -hmm. Only calls God that once in Psalm 111. But you see here, the Bible says that a man and a woman should have the fear of the Lord, a reverence of God. That should be the characteristic of a Christian. 
and we can ask ourselves again how far have we progressed down our walk with Jesus as to how much I fear the Lord. Are we conscious that he's assessing our life? Are we conscious that he's in the room with us? Are we conscious that he knows everything we do? Are we conscious that he loves us and he will forgive us, but we recognize that he's in the driving seat? That's really what the fear of the Lord is. How much do you fear Jesus? Well, that will determine how far you are down the Christian life. You see, it's an amazing thing, isn't it? You can look at all these things. If you're faithful and really committed, well, you're moving along with Christ. If you really love people like Christ loves, loves them, well, you're really moving along with Christ. If you're able to forgive people whatever they've done to you, well, you're moving along with Christ. This is part of character. This is nothing about giving out gospel tracts or being a preacher or a missionary. This is our insides. This is making us more like Jesus. Because all of these characteristics, if we looked into the face of Jesus, we'd see them shining out and radiating out the glory of God. It's what we're like which is preeminent over what we do, and we need to remember that. Have a look at chapter 4 and verse number 1. Just a couple more and then we'll be through. And here Paul says, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. And here Paul is saying that the character of a genuine Christian will be honest. He was saying here to his masters or instructing masters or employers, if you like, to make sure they were just to their employees. And you know, elsewhere we read in the Bible about honesty. A characteristic of a genuine Christian should be honesty. There's no fiddling the books for a Christian, you see. There's no hiding our tax affairs from the HMRC, even though we may not like paying tax. There can't be any of that in the Christian. There's no uh, 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 stealing something by the back door. There's none of that. Because a Christian's different. And our character should be honest. And if the world sees that a Christian falls through dishonesty, it brings a shame on the cause of Christ. Mm. Folks, make sure that everything you do is honest, legal, and above board. That's very, very important. And it's part of our character. So Paul says here, you employers, don't rob your employees. Give them what's due, because that's the honest thing to do. And so we also should be honest in all our dealings. Be honest in your relationships. Be honest in your friendships. Those of you who are married, be honest in your marriage. God will bless you if you are honest and do what's right. It's a characteristic. We can't expect the world to be honest, those outside of Christ. They're always on the take and always on the make. That's just how they operate. They're always climbing the ladder in their employment, crushing everybody underneath so that they can be preeminent and noticed and become famous. You'd expect that in the world. But as Christians, our character should be honest. You know, we need to be honest with ourselves honest with other people, and honest with God. And if we are, we can move on in the Christian life. Have a look at uh, Colossians 4 and verse number 5 here. And the Bible says here, again address, addressing these Christians at Colossae, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. And here the character of a genuine Christian, I believe is Paul is saying here, will include wisdom and time consciousness. And Pastor Jonathan mentioned something about this this morning when he brought that wonderful message on Ecclesiastes. You see, folks, a genuine Christian has a character of knowing we're not going to be here forever. A genuine Christian recognises that God has given them a certain amount of time and their character will be to redeem that time, buy that time back for Jesus. That's what the character should be, you know. Yeah, I may have to turn the, the TV off once in a while. You know, I may even have to sacrifice a World Cup final. Yeah, I, I may perhaps have to forego my game of cards tonight 
or I may have to forego seeing the latest cricket match because we've got to redeem the time, folks. We've got to do it what's useful because people are going to the lake of fire. And so the Christians can redeem the time. Only a Christian with that type of character can do that. It's so important. You know, I spoke a few weeks ago to somebody on the doors, an elderly gentleman, uh, and he said, I'm not really interested anyway. We did eventually get a conversation going, and he was in his 80s, and I looked at him and I said, have you ever realised the shortness of time? It seems to me that you're at the age now where you need to be thinking about eternity. And I put my finger up and I asked him to look at it, and I said, tick, 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 tick. And I said, the clock's ticking for you. I said, it may not be very long before the hearse pulls up in your drive. You see, he wasn't redeeming the time. You as a Christian should be redeeming the time. We only pass this way once. And the character of a Christian should be, let's go all out for using it, for doing something for Jesus. Let's spend more time to allow him to change me into more Christ-likeness, and then I'll be more effective for him. In other words, we all should be able to look back to June the 29th, last year, 2013, and say, well, by the grace of God, I believe I'm a little more like Jesus this year. That's actually the truth of it. And we can only do that by redeeming the time. We're not going to do that by reading the Daily Express, folks, or the Daily Mail. You know, we're not going to do that by listening to the Parliament channel on the television. We're not going to do that by getting excited about all those sorts of things. We're going to do it by spending time with Jesus. That's redeeming the time. And you've heard me say this before as well, but it's worth repeating. I honestly believe that one hour with Jesus is worth two weeks in Tenerife. I really believe that, folks. Because it's redeeming the time. It's causing me to become more like Jesus. And that's what he wants. And then finally, the last characteristic, if you like, although there's many more here, in the book of Colossians, chapter 4 and verse number 6. And the Bible says here, after verse number 5, where we looked at redeeming the time, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. And this is an important characteristic of the Christian character. You see, the character of a genuine Christian will include right speaking. Mm -hmm. What comes out of our mouth is going to betray who we really are. You know, we can come into the house of God and we can speak the right words, you know. We can talk about sanctification. What a wonderful word that is. We can talk about the tribulation. We can talk about glorification. We can talk about all these spiritual things. But actually, on a Monday morning, when we're in our home situation, our family situation, or in our school situation, or in our work situation, what is coming out of our mouth, that's important, folks. Paul says here, you see, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. Now, have a look, if you would, at Psalm 37 and verse number 30, just before we close a couple of verses. See, what comes out of our mouth reflects what's in our heart. That's really what the Bible teaches. It really teaches us what character we are. Psalm 37 and verse number 30. Look at these few verses on, on the mouth and the tongue. Psalm 37 and verse 30, the mouth of the righteous, and the righteous are as always a Christian, the mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. See, out of the character of a Christian, you'd expect some wisdom to be coming out. That's the characteristic of a Christian. Have a look at Proverbs 15 and verse number 4. Proverbs 15 and verse number 4. And the Bible says there, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. What a great verse that is. A wholesome tongue, a righteous tongue, a Christian tongue, is a tree of life, but perverseness 
therein is a breach in the spirit. Have a look at Proverbs 16 and verse number 24. And the Bible says there, Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. You see how much difference being a Christian and being a genuine Christian character can make in our society. You see, we're going to speak godly words, pleasant words, words of mercy, words of kindness, words of grace. And according to this, they're sweet to the soul. What a powerful position we are in as Christians to be able to speak God's words to people. Have a look at Proverbs 25 and verse number 11. And the Bible says there, and if you remember no other verses tonight, please remember this verse. It says here, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. What a wonderful work, work, verse there. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and uh, apples of gold in pictures or pictures of silver. So, just backing up then, the character of a Christian in just the book of Colossians. If somebody were to say to you, what would be the outstanding marks and characteristics of a Christian? You would be able to say, well, Paul teaches in the book of Colossians it will include faithfulness. Mm. It will include Christian love. Mm. It will include hope. It will include assurance. It will include mercy and kindness and humility. It will include forbearance, putting up with that brother who irritates you sometimes. Mm. And rather than condemning him, mm. being a blessing to him, it will certainly include, if he claims to be a Christian, that he's able to forgive others as Jesus forgiven him. A characteristic of a genuine Christian will also include being able to praise the Lord, not necessarily doing glory rolls every two minutes, but praising the Lord in our hearts. Amen. Also include the fear of the Lord, and one of the chief characteristics is honest. There goes an honest man, somebody who knows what he believes, sticks by his principles, isn't going to defraud or rob anybody. Amen. He's going to be honest with himself. Honest in his relationships, honest with God, and honest with what the scripture says. And then, the characteristic of that Christian, well, he should be a man or woman of wisdom, and should be time conscious. The unbeliever thinks he's going to live here forever. You know there's only one life. Time is short. Redeeming the time. That's what the scripture says. And then, certainly, the character of a Christian should be and include right speaking. Ultimately, everything in our heart is going to be betrayed by what we speak. If, we, if Joe Bloggs over here says, I'm a Christian, well, check out their words. Check out their words when they're in the hospital bed. Check out their words when they're on the, on the job. Check out their words when they're with their pagan friends at college or school. Our words will really determine what our character is. Jesus said we'll be judged for every idle word we've ever spoken. That's a challenge, isn't it, folks? Mm. And so our character actually is even more important than what we do for Jesus. We should be being changed into the image of the Son of God and we should be more Christ-like every day. Ultimately, that's what's going to draw people to the cross because they'll see that he's made a difference in our lives and therefore, they may scratch their head, they may wonder why, but they may even come to you and say, well, why do you react that way in that particular circumstance? And then that opens a door for a wonderful opportunity to tell them it's all to do with him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jonathan. Amen. Well, that's